So I am the best practice innovation manager for Mondelez. And for those of you who go, who the heck is Mondelez? Mondelez is that big umbrella global corporate company that covers brands like Cadbury, Oreo, Vegemite, um, Oreo, but Philadelphia cream cheese. So a lot of the brands that you already know within this country. Uh, we sell internationally all around the world, and we work internationally all around the world. Now, what I am also is the industry partner for the research hub that is all about unlocking the food value chain, Australian food industry transformation for the Asian markets. And so what we did uh, about two years ago is we set up this research that the Australian Research Council is funding. funding. The University of Melbourne funds and puts resources in, and Mondelez funds and put resources in. And you can say, why would a large multinational want to do that? Well, basically, we're one of the largest food manufacturers in this country. And if we don't figure out how to grow the food industry ourselves, we're not going to have the people or the resources that we need to run our business. Now, <clears throat> when we look at premium export into Asia, what we find is there's a huge demographic shift that's happening. Right now, there's more people living inside that circle than outside of it, which is great for Australia, because finally Australia is in the right neighborhood. They've always, as they looked at export markets, looked at Europe, looked at Canada, and said it's a bit too far away. But the demographic shift is that the middle class is moving. It's moving from the US as the center largest middle class to now into Asia, and China particularly, and Indonesia, which will have the largest middle class. The middle class for Australia is about 12 million people. The middle class for China is 400 million. When you think about markets, I'd rather play to the bigger market. It's a heck of a lot easier to sell in a bigger market than in a smaller one. When you look at the affluent consumer in China, that's consumers making more than 150,000, there's 50 million of them in China. So when we see this middle class growth, what we start to see is not only is the size there, the money to spend is there, but they're also translating that money and spending into a desire for premium food products. And so in 2012, when the Australian government said, Asian century, this is a huge opportunity, what they didn't realize is they said, we can be the food bowl to Australia. Well, as Peter just reflected, the entire pork production here in this country can be consumed in 72 hours. So you can't really be the food bowl. And so we've really stepped back and said, premium products are the way to go. How do we be the deli? How do we be the delicatessen where all the good tasting but also high value products are that consumers want? And so it drives a different shift in mindset. Now, when you look at export to Asia, there's two different mindsets you can take. One is you can be a trader. I'm going to take the products that I make right now. I'm going to lift them. I'm going to launch them into the market as they are. And hopefully, cross my fingers, that everybody will want them and buy them. Because goodness, I love them, so why shouldn't they? Or I can take a marketer's perspective, which is I'm going to learn about the market. And I'm going to begin to modify and tweak my products and figure out how I can pick them up and export them into Asia. I love this picture because it makes it very clear that when we think about food from a Western perspective or an Asian perspective, it's really different. So from a Western perspective, I use utensils. If I'm eating meat, I want a big slab of meat, and I'll slice and cut that meat down. When I look from an Asian perspective, I'm using chopsticks. So what I expect from that meat is very different. I expect it to actually be pre-cut before I'm actually going to eat it. So it drives a difference in behavior. We see a difference in terms of how comfortable pe people are in touching food. So in the West, we're willing to touch the food with our hands. In Asia, not so much. And so it truly changes how you begin to think of how I'm going to create this product and how I'm going to package it. When we look at the difference across the region, there's a massive amount of different cultures across the region. There's this incredible need for underlying cultural insights. We don't understand our biases until we actually test them against another culture. Because growing up in this culture, you don't really understand what's different with another culture until you actually begin to see it. 
And so what we start to see in this entire world is we really need to understand what the cultural differences are. And let me talk a little bit about China. <clears throat> when the Chinese look at food, it's daily therapy. When we look at food from a Western perspective, we think of it in terms of its protein, its fat, its carbohydrates, might be some macronutrients, micronutrients, some vitamins, etc. When China looks at it, it is their holistic health. They think of it in terms of traditional Chinese medicine. How do I put heating foods and cooling foods together? What combination of foods should I put together that make me healthy? They think in terms of I need to eat a variety of foods. Our nutritionists will tell us certainly you need to eat a variety of different colors of fruits and vegetables. But the Chinese are really looking for that diversity because they're linking it very clearly to their overall health. When they look at the sheer migration from rural China into urban China that has happened in the past couple of years, where they're going into are environments that are not as clean as they were in the rural environment. So if anyone's been to Beijing recently, seeing the blue sky is kind of a novel thing. It's pretty dirty, it's pretty polluted. And the Chinese look at food as their ability to deal with some of these stressors and some of these pollutants. Family is critical within China. Family critical everywhere, but with China, it's even heightened more. The traditional Chinese way of eating was you ate a big breakfast, you ate a moderate lunch, and you ate a small dinner. Because of this shift from rural to urban environments, you go off to work first thing in the morning, so everybody's grabbing a small breakfast. You might eat lunch at the company caf caffeine, uh, cafeteria, or you might eat in the office. And then dinner is a time when the entire family gets together and connects. And so you end up eating a very large dinner, typically two meats, three vegetables. And that drives a significant change in the choices of foods that they're looking for. Another key piece that is very specific to Asia and China is that food is shared. When I go to a restaurant here in the West, I order the food I want at the restaurant. When you go to the restaurant in China, you order the food for the entire table and everyone shares. This idea of sharing is really critical. Now, if I think of this from a potato chip perspective, here in the West, the package is built so that I open the package from the top of the package, I put my hand in and the package has to be wide enough so I can get my hand in there and I can grab a couple of potato chips. From an Asian perspective, the package is built to open down the side so it opens up as a bowl, so that I can then begin to share it with others. And so thinking about some of these basic cultural differences drives a difference in how we think about packaging. Food scandals, huge, huge issue for China. It is the biggest concern, more so than public corruption, more so than transportation issues, more so than anything else they're worried about within China. They're frightened about their food. They don't think that it's safe. They know that people will be meddling with it. The melanin scare in the infant formula is a perfect example. When you live in a one-child policy country at that time and your only child dies because the food was adulterated, that's pretty frightening. When you also consider the transportation within China, it's pretty dirty, it's pretty unhygienic. And so they're very, very concerned about what's going on. Now what this does do is it drives a change in packaging again. You can see that banana that's sitting inside a bag. Now from a Western perspective, we'd be going, that's overpackaged. Why do you need that? From a Chinese perspective, they're looking at it, that's safer, that's cleaner. Same thing with the melon, which has two layers of packaging, just so that they feel it's safer and cleaner. A huge shift is happening in shopping. 40% of Chinese consumers shop online for fresh food and packaged food. That's versus 6% of Australians. And in this $450 billion online market, $150 billion of it is mobile, on your mobile phone. And so that's huge differences in terms of how people think about procuring products and where they go. And so ensuring that you're connected to an appropriate online retailer or that your website is appropriate for the country is really, truly critical. Now, within the research hub, 
the ARC grant, we have six research streams, and I'm going to go through all six of them and give you a little bit of what we've learned. We've been going for about two years now. In the consumer insights stream, one of the key things we've learned is that clean and green is not enough. That you really have to start telling this idea of provenance. That you've got to start saying what is unique about Australia. Now, I know everybody talks about clean and green, but let's be clear. Yes, Australia is clean and green. So is the United States, so is Europe, so is a good chunk of South America. So when you think you're competing, you're leveraging clean and green in Australia as your country of origin, that's not enough. You've got some pretty tough competitors out there who are also saying the exact same thing. Now let me, let me give you an example. Northcote Milk spent two years building a cold chain supply chain to get fresh milk from Australia into China. They were able to build a 20 million liter supply chain. They sold their fresh milk for 10 to 12 dollars a liter. Compare that to what we're paying here, one to two. And that they leveraged the idea of country of origin and said it was clean and green, it came from Australia, that made it premium. The very next year, A2 Milk came into the same market, leveraged their supply chain, and went to their partner in their supply chain and said, hey, you have all this extra capacity, let us in. The partner said yes, and they got in. They leveraged provenance. They talked about A2 milk having a special protein that made it more easily digestible. And for a population that is lactose intolerant, this was fantastic news. They talked about the fact that it was a premium product for a special occasion. Now, the difference is that Norcote Milk was selling 2.6 million liters per year as of this year. And A2, because they leveraged more than country of origin, but it actually leveraged provenance, was selling 3 million liters of milk in the same time frame. Now, usually the second player comes in and doesn't get as large a market share as the first player. But this begins to speak to the fact that country of origin and provenance are very, very different. The other piece of research that we do is on gifting. The Asian culture is all about gifting. It's all about that social lubrication within a common environment. And so understanding how products fit within that gifting structure is really critical. We did some research on red meat, and in, certainly in my country, a bit here in Australia, you would give meat in a box as a gift. In China, no, not so much. But you pair that with wine, and suddenly it does become a premium gift. And so understanding some of those key pieces of how the premiumness of the gift is driven and how you can actually leverage that to drive some of the meat opportunities. Another area that we're focused in on is market analytics. This is where we're looking at intellectual property. And we've built the first intellectual property database that covers all of Asia. So if you want to go find intellectual property from Malaysia, Indonesia, or the Philippines, or India, you have to go to that country. And you have to talk to their patent office. You have to tell them what patent you want to see, and they'll go and get it for you. We leveraged the fact that a university could certainly do this. Mondelez couldn't. And they went out to those countries, and we built this patent database. Now, when you build a patent database that covers all the countries of Asia, including India, you can see a lot of different things when you start looking and analyzing that data. We can begin to see that how a problem gets solved is very different from one country to another. So for example, here in Australia, we might think of milk as flavored milk, as I've got milk with a flavorant in it. But when I go to China, I'm looking at a thinner milk. I'm looking at a milk that's been carbonated. I'm looking at milk that has fruit juice in it to drive its flavor. Very different ways of solving the problem. If we think of refreshment here in the West, it's cool. It might have a couple bubbles in it. It might be sweet, sour, and then it disappears very quickly. Within Asia, we're now looking at traditional Chinese medicine. We're looking at bone soup as a refreshment ingredient. And so how the problem gets solved can be very, very different. The other piece of this that we did is we've understood what that consumer experience is from a premium perspective. And we can leverage that experience perspective to understand what's actually going on in the marketplace and where the key competitors in that market are investing in intellectual property. Another area that we're focused in on is sensory. 
because we've learned that premium products have an incredibly high level of emotional engagement. You may love your more everyday products, but if you're going to pay more money for your product, you better be very emotionally engaged with it. Because when we look at consumer choice, 70 to 80% of your choice is unconscious or emotion driven. We can think rationally that we're making choices, but realistically, it's a lot of our emotions that are engaged that help us make those choices. And so what we're building is an emotion app that leverages biometrics because Mondelez has a corporate responsibility that we will say we will never touch a consumer to measure their emotional response. So we won't put the skull cap on you. We won't put the wristband on you. That's not what we do. But we, we are leveraging the camera that sits within your iPad, your computer, to look at your face and look at eye tracking, look at body temperature, look at heart rate, look at facial expressions, lean in, lean out posture, to begin to understand your emotional response to products, packaging, and communication. Now, the big win for the meat industry is we're starting to look at how do we take some of those learnings and apply them to animals so that we can begin to measure their stress levels as they are going through the growing process. Another piece that we've built is an ability to understand what are some of the barriers to entry, a very simple focus group type process where we work with consumers because the university has a never ending set of consumers that are from that country. We leverage the students who are in Australia less than two years and they give us a lot of responses and help us understand what are the barriers to entry and what's working, what's not working. So that before you go into country and do research, we can do it very quickly here. Another piece that we're leveraged in on is supply chain. And really understanding that supply chain from a holistic perspective, looking at 16 different variables, because what was very surprising when we did the initial research was we found that no one had actually looked that broadly. They typically delved very deeply into logistics or warehousing or distribution, whatever. And so we're building that trade-off analysis so that you can begin to look at your supply chain and think of different ways to leverage it better and build a better business model. Another piece that we're connected in on is on packaging. Because packaging drives that in initial perception of premiumness, but it also drives security. So we understand what are the attributes of packaging that drive premiumness, but we're building an understanding of anti-counterfeiting. So what are all the technologies out there? What are the future technologies that are coming? And how do you make those trade-offs? The Australian bill, dollar bill, has 10 levels of anti-counterfeiting protection, five of which the consumer sees, five of which the bank industry sees. It's understanding how do we bundle different levels of anti-counterfeiting protection to fit your cost structure, but also the fact that an amazing amount of products are counterfeited. So if I go back to my Norcoat milk example, they were on shelf and in 72 hours, a counterfeited version was sitting next to them on shelf and it certainly did not come out of Australia. And they were getting the 10 to $12 a liter that Norcoat had built. We're also looking at encapsulation and emulsifiers because as we look at premium food products, that clarity of flavor, that healthier ingredient, if we can add it in, is truly, truly critical. And finally, we're working with small and medium-sized co companies to begin to consider what is the risk that they're looking at when they think of how do I export into Asia. You know, they know the risks of dealing with coals and woolies, dealing with all the complexity of how do I move my product make my product fit the market, move it into the market, and deal with the retailers there. They have all those questions and they don't fully understand exactly how to make that happen. Some of the, you can see our website here, which I would say please go visit the website because as we keep working through, all the research that we do will be up on the website so that you can access it. And with that, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for? I'm only walking over here so that you can hear what I'm saying. Um, so I had a question, if nobody else did. Thanks, Hollis. That was really interesting. Um, I was just wondering how far away you think Australia is from entering the Chinese market without pork and what the first step for producers and processors would be to start planning for that shift? 
I think that's a great question for all three of us. Um, what I've, I'm not a pork expert, but I've, what I've heard clearly today is that the agreement needs to be negotiated that pork is a product that should be exported into China without duties and uh, cut, uh, extra money added on. But however, when you think about that, you've got to get ready for that because it'll take the government a little while to negotiate that. But once they have it negotiated, the floodgates will be open and you've got to be ready to run because the Chinese market moves really fast. And if I could add to that, a um, couple of things. The first one is that um, whether we do or don't have protocols for China doesn't stop us going to any other city in Asia where there are plenty of rich people too. Um, and if I was you as a producer, what would I be doing? I'd be working on my story because that, that's the, a, a bit which is unique to your <coughs> farm or property. And one of the things that's been very clear both from yesterday and today is if you haven't got a, a unique and uh, sustainable story, you're going to end up getting copied. Does anybody else have any questions? Because I still have one, one, one question. So, Hollis, my, my question is, um, in sensory uh, testing, do you find that um, there, is, there are differences in language between mm -hmm. different people from different backgrounds? Yes. And so the sensory testing we're doing, we can do the traditional sensory testing, which is, you know, here's my six attributes, Le measure the intensity level of those different attributes. The kind of sensory testing we're doing is much more front end type sensory testing where we're looking at how cons consumers respond to a set of stimuli that we've designed in a very clear experimental design. What we found when we originally started doing that work, we were looking at the difference between healthy and indulgent. Now what we found is that Chinese consumers clearly get healthy and so do Western consumers. When we deal with the word of indulgence, from a Western perspective, that's typically something treat-like, that's typically something very special. When Chinese consumers get indulgent, it's something that they want to stay away from because their fundamental value in eating is they need to moderate their eating. And so really began to kind of do our heads in because we couldn't understand it was different until we saw the behaviors and began to see some of the differences. Cool. Well, if that's it, okay. thank you very much, Hollis. That's great. And we'd like to present you with a bottle of wine as a thank you. Oh, that's nice. Yay.